Tiny Kin is, in my opinion, much better than most people are going to give it credit for. Forget about comparisons to Pikmin, developers Splash Team have created something entirely of their own, and it combines the charm of Toy Story, exceptional level design, and delightful visuals to create something entirely captivating. Of course, as with any game, it has its flaws which we'll go through, but it certainly isn't a Pikmin clone, and to call it so would be a disservice. A thanks to Tiny Build for the review copy, does Tiny Kin fully meet our giant expectations. Well, let's find out. Like something straight out of a Saturday morning cartoon, Milo arrives on Earth, outfitted in his rather fetching spacesuit, only to find that his stature isn't quite what he remembers, and that not a single day has passed since 1991. The story sees him trying to piece back together Ridmi's mysterious machine. This is comprised of several components scattered around the house. The house itself is said to belong to Ardwin. Who on earth is Ardwin, you may ask? Well, he's the former owner of the house, whom all the inhabitants now worship as a deity. There's even a church in one level dedicated to this figure. Through the power of, uh, well, it's a game, Milo can talk to any of the insects that he finds along his way. Sometimes they'll have special side missions for him that involve collecting certain items, and these usually reference pop culture, such as delivering a makeshift wooden door made from old pegs to an insect lady named Rose. There are a few lovingly animated sections, but a large chunk of this world's lore is player-driven and entirely optional. When it comes to the gameplay and controls, there is so much to love here. As with any good puzzle platformer, there are many different ways to navigate around the world. The standard running and jumping, but it's the soapboard sliding that steals the show and captures the all-important but often forgotten aspect of making traversal enjoyable. While it slides freely across flat surfaces, it will gain momentum when downhill and be much slower when trying to head up. You've got a cute little pop shove it and of course you can grind on string rails. Next up, we've got Milo's bubble jump, which allows him a few moments to briefly glide. This can also be upgraded through some of the side quests and doing so will be required to reach some of the secret areas as well as completing some of those other activities. Now the core structure is obviously focused around the tiny kin themselves. These small creatures hatch out of eggs, although my daughter did ask me who laid the eggs, and I sat there scratching my head for a few moments. They come in a number of different colours pink, red, green, blue, and gold. And these colors reflect their abilities. Those pink or purple tinykin are the strong ones. They're able to carry heavy items, move objects, push blocks, and generally help you to interact with any movable objects in the world. Different things will require different amounts of these. And very often you'll find you simply don't have enough and will have to go off and look for more. The red tinykin are the explosive variety. They'll help you clear paths, break containers, and blowing things up is always fun. Others, such as the green, can be stacked up, allowing you to reach higher areas, or with the blue join to create electrical connections. They're used in different ways, but generally by holding one trigger and then pressing another, you can fire them in the direction you need. But there'll always be a numerical value attached to denote the number required. But while the tiny kin serve to facilitate navigation throughout these stages, it's the beautifully designed levels that really stand out to me. It's like that first time stepping out into the playground, looking at all the different equipment and toys that you can use and just heading off in whichever direction you fancy and that's another area it succeeds in allowing the player to simply explore initially in a level you may have no main objective but after some short exploration it always became clear what a good platformer does is use signposting by placing coins or other collectibles to steer the player in a direction so they don't get frustrated and lost and that's what's taking place here by using the several different color of tiny kin there's an element of guiding you around as you search for a particular colour needed that just feels organic. As I jump across the keys on a piano and notice that there's one black key missing, I'm well aware I'll stumble across it eventually, but I don't feel the need to go out of my way to find it, and I don't need to go out of my way to find it because of the way the stages are structured. Now there are shortcuts which are unlocked which generally push you back towards the middle of an area. These use the aforementioned soap grinding ability, and it's cleverly used to make what's initially a gigantic and overwhelming stage into one that's easily traversed quickly as you collect the different items you need in the world and perform the different tasks required navigation gets faster and faster. It's quite
quite subtle and you might not initially notice it until three or four levels in but it's also clearly intentional. It mitigates some of the frustration that may have arisen had they simply had you navigate with the same standard speed the whole time. In this same vein there are a number of shortcuts that are gradually unlocked which serves to do the same thing in a vertical manner. Tinykin has no combat and I think it suits it. I'm sure there are some people that would prefer perhaps more challenge as when you fall and die here you simply respawn from the ledge you fell from but there's a freedom sometimes in not having any threat. I didn't feel a lack of challenge, the platforming itself is quite tricky, but you always know the core objective of each level is to find that unique item to go towards building the machine. The game's broken up into several different levels, each with their own theme. Once you've completed them, you can revisit older ones, and I really recommend doing that if you want to get the most out of the title. There's so many little secrets, so many hidden things, although some form of fast travel between the cities would have been a nice touch, and and probably my biggest gripe with the whole game and the one that affects gameplay the most is the jump speed. I know that might sound ridiculous but the character jumps too quickly. There are certain moves that require a double tap such as the bubble jump and it's just a bit too quick. Is it a game breaking problem? Absolutely not. Is it something that most people would notice? Maybe not. Am I being entirely pedantic? Potentially. But slowing that down slightly could have increased the feeling of control. But there is so much to love here and so many different achievements to guide you towards the other hidden content that you might not initially see. I thoroughly enjoy the gameplay. It scores 19 out of 20. And the controls, while not quite as good, are still more than adequate. They score 17 out of 20. Visually, Tinykin looks great. I'm reminded of Hypercharge Unboxed in terms of the amount of detail crammed into every level. Not just VHS tapes or references to Jurassic Park, but you'll find work in Scalectrix. Ants living in a ramshackle home with matchboxes for beds, or a small group of shops built out of assorted items and books. Everywhere you turn, you'll find something that's eye-catching, but it'll also be made out of household items. It's really quite clever. Performance wise, well, we're looking at 30 frames per second, but this is potentially the biggest issue with Tinykin at the moment. Currently, there are some stages where frame rates can drop quite significantly. Now, with that being said, when you're not facing the center of an area where the view distance is greater and it's having to render the entire map, things are generally 30 FPS most of the time. However, you will always notice when you look back over the whole area how there's a slight drop. Now, in the first four or five stages, this is okay. In the last couple, it's a bit more significant. Not to the point of being hugely degrading to the gameplay, which is important, but it will need a bit of patchwork to get everything smoothed out. In handheld, things run about the same. Some of the stages, as we see here with the latter one, do tend to hold 30 FPS with reasonable frame pacing, but as it drops below, that's where things again could use a little improvement. Still absolutely playable, but worth noting. While there's no voice acting, each creature makes a unique sound when you talk to them, and the musical score is excellent. This changes depending on your location while keeping the same underlying beat. This is important because things like carrying items, your cute little tinykin will chant in time with the game's music. It gives everything a real rhythmic feeling and a strong early example of how that soundtrack is dynamic can be shown here in the bathroom party. When the party starts, the music changes while keeping the same rhythm and then as you move away from it, it drops back to the original soundtrack. Just another detail in a game filled with them, like when I left the room for a couple of minutes, only to return to find my kids laughing at the fact that all the tiny kin and the main character had gone to sleep. Visuals and performance combined, at the moment with the issues, score 15 out of 20. They'd easily go higher than that, but I can't give a game that can't maintain 30 FPS all the time a higher score. Audio is exceptional, although it could have done with a little bit more variety. It scores 19 out of 20. For the next 24 hours, tiny kin is 10% off, but the RRP is £21.59 or your regional equivalent. I had heard that it was around about five hours to complete the game, but that's simply not the case if you're anyone that takes their time in any way, shape or form. With the side content, the hidden missions and all of the little secrets in there, you're looking much closer to 10 hours, even going to 15 if you want to get all the achievements. It's all crammed into a relatively small 2.1 gigabyte package and there is an extensive demo available if you wanted to give it a try before you buy. With value 
you we take everything into account. Gameplay, controls, visuals, performance, as well as the length. And for me, I give value 16 out of 20. Tinykin is a slice of refined fun, and it captures the very essence of gaming, that being enjoying yourself. And I've spent eight hours today and yesterday doing exactly that. It comes highly recommended from us here at Switch Up and gets a score of 86%. Let us know in the comments if you played the demo, if you enjoyed it, or if you picked up the full game. If you do so, save yourself 10%. Use code SWITCHUP to buy your eShop credit over at switchup.gg if you're in the EU or US regions. Thanks to all of you and to our new patrons, and yeah, you guys just support the channel. We really appreciate it. Check out Glenn's review of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Cowabunga Collection, and as always, for all things Switch all the time, keep it Switch Up. Cheers, guys. See ya!